Lounging Sun. All right, welcome back to the Comic Lounge. My name is Ryan, and with me today, I have one of my favorite cartoonists in the biz. I got Phil Hester with me. You know him from The Wretch, did a clerk story with Kevin Smith, reunited with him for Green Arrow, done The Darkness, done, uh, you know, a lot of DC stuff, a lot of Marvel stuff over the year. And uh, it's a huge pleasure to have you on the show finally, dude. All right, thanks. I always like to ask everybody, you know, for, especially if it's the first time that I have them on the show, first time, you know, what was your first experience with comics? What started that love for the medium? Yeah, I, when I think back on it, I think, I feel like they're always part of my life. Like, I can't remember a time when I wasn't at least looking at comics, even if I couldn't read them. Mm -hmm. And I think I got really serious about them. Um, I have kind of, I don't want to say I have hippie uncles, but I had sort of counterculture uncles that grew up in the 70s. So they were sort of my gateway to all these really cool, weird comics like Swamp Thing and Plop and just really oddball stuff that I'd never seen before. And that really sort of uh, lit a fire under me. And also in the 70s, it's it'd be hard for current comic book readers to understand this. But in the 70s, you couldn't go anywhere without seeing comics. Like if you went to the grocery store, there were comics, at the drugstore, at the convenience store, there were comics everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, and they're always like at kid level, right? So, yeah. um, so naturally you're drawn to those. And I grew up in the time of the three packs, you know, like you'd go to Woolworth and there'd be like a three pack hung on a spinner rack yeah. and you get three comics for, you know, 50 cents or 75 cents or whatever. And to me, that was, th those were all these gateways that just made comics a sort of ubiquitous part of my childhood. And then I would say when I was about 10 or 11, um, I really got into like, I was starting to be able to recognize artists um, by their styles. And I was starting to pay attention, especially to Marvel comics because they had credits mm -hmm. at the front. You could tell who was doing everything. And um, uh, I had an issue of, I've told this story a million times. So if you've heard this story before, I apologize. But I had an issue of Iron Man that ended on a cliffhanger. Um, it was, Tony Stark got thrown off the helicarrier without his armor on but he had his case. Mm -hmm. So he had to put on his armor in free fall. And this is before, you know, the movies where you like tap a button and your, right, right. your armor comes on. He had to put it on piece by piece. And so he's in free fall at the end of that cliffhanger. And back then when you were a kid, you didn't, you never knew if you were going to get the next issue of a book. Yeah. And I felt like I couldn't wait to find the next issue of the book. So I wrote and drew my own ending to that. And like a little switch went off in my head that like, oh, maybe I can do that. Maybe I can do this someday and be one of these people whose names are at the front of this comic. That's sort of where it really got serious for me. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned like comics being everywhere. And I remember as a kid, when I was growing up, they were they were still everywhere. They were in 7-Elevens, I mean, yeah. uh, grocery stores, drug stores, like everywhere. Like it was it was really accessible as opposed to now with you know, specialty stores, and that's about all you're going to find them in. I do think it's interesting you were talking about, like, you know, the, the 70s, the, those kind of comics, the underground stuff. What were, and I, and recently I just discovered that you did a story in Taboo, C. Bissett's Taboo, and I, I just happened to, like, stumble upon it. So um, what were some of those, like, indie underground stuff, things that really stood out to you from that, from that period? Uh, I was a, I was a big fan of, um, well, Plop is sort of, Plop was DC's attempt to like right. sort of get in on that underground mm -hmm. vibe at least. Um, they couldn't get as, you know, outrageous with the subject matter like underground books could. But I, <laughs> well, speaking of comics being everywhere, I was so into comics, I would go find the comics that weren't everywhere. So if you wanted to get underground books back then, you basically had to go to head shops. Mm -hmm. There's no like, there were no laws against like little kids going into head shops. <laughs> so I would like, I was a little, little, but I was like 13 and 14 and going into head shops to get Fantagore, you know, which was <laughs> like my favorite, my favorite underground book, but I'd get, you know, like Fantagore and like Tales of the Leather Nun, just like whatever, if it was comics, I was into it. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, Gore Shriek, like whatever I could get, like any indie thing I could get, I would get. And, I was so like, I was just like had a voracious appetite for comics that went 
to the point that like Marvel, I was never like a Marvel kid or a DC kid. I was like an everything kid. So like when mm -hmm. I would see something that wasn't Marvel or DC, to me, that was like super thrilling. So if I could see, so when I saw like my first Captain Canuck, uh, that like blew my mind. I was like, oh, wow, this is a whole new kind of comics and it's colored differently from other comics. And, mm -hmm. uh, or when Pacific came about, um, I think I, to this day, I think I still own every Pacific comic. Um, that's awesome. I was just so anxious for new stuff. And um, that's never gone away. I was, I, that's sort of the exciting thing to me about, about still being a comics reader and uh, on top of a creator is I'm still into the new places that comics are going. And uh, it's always fun to sort of just see what, see what the kids are up to. Yeah, I think that that's, I, that's why comics are my favorite medium because it's constantly evolving. There's always, there's something for everybody, no matter when your tastes change, there's going to be a comic book that will accommodate your taste changing. So if you grow out of wanting to read superheroes, there's so much content being put out. Um, I mean, I still read everything. I don't really, I've never stopped reading superheroes. I still read that. And then I also get a lot of indie stuff as well. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it is pretty exciting to see where comics continues to go. Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing that like, um, when I, when I came up, if you were into comics, you had, you, you sort of had to be into superhero comics, because that like ran the, ran the roost. But like, now you could credibly call yourself a comic book fan, and never buy anything but like what Image puts out, or never buy anything but like manga romances, and you're still a comic book fan. And uh, to me that's great it's it's a great to see this kind of i know a lot of people bemoan the death of like these really titanic sales numbers that came from uh, as much lack of choice as anything else like i wasn't particularly a conan like a conan super fan mm -hmm. but i like comics and like conan was out so i went and got conan like now that's now you can you can comics are narrow casted to people you can get something that basically just all you're interested in you're served and that didn't it didn't used to be that way yeah i know i, I mean even just from the time i started reading to seeing like where it's gone is it's a uh, it's pretty crazy you know yeah um, and you also mentioned you know like that you started paying attention to creators and stuff and and as you go and i do think that it is interesting that like i've gone back and i've read comics from that era and dc didn't have the credits which is kind of yeah, kind of weird miss. like marvel was pretty standardized they were always going to be at the bottom of the splash page yeah and at dc occasionally you'd have a couple people sign something or it would be under the title maybe it wasn't as like standardized so and in a way that was also fun for me because once i started being able to pick out people's styles it was a challenge to me to like figure out like Oh, this Batman is clearly Don Newton, but it doesn't look like last issue's Don Newton. It's inked by somebody else, you know. And I would sort of like piece together what people's styles were. And to me, that was as much fun as anything else. That was sort of like being a, a stat head for comics, you know. And who are some of those creators in your early days of like paying attention to it that kind of really stood out and kind of maybe it also influenced your specific art style? Yeah, uh, of course, like the when I was a kid, the easiest artist to pick out was Jack Kirby. Yeah. Because Jack Kirby, especially in the 70s, had become so stylized that, um, you know, you could spot him a mile away. And his stuff was so dynamic that it really was like, it was never just going to lay there. You know, he, it was always going to like pop out at you. And I, I remember it's the first time I ever felt like a separation between one of my friends when I was staying over at his house. And he called Jack Kirby the square finger guy. And I was like, what's wrong with you, man? <laughs> that's Jack yeah. Kirby. But I mean, I guess he just dressed to wear fingers, but that's cool. You know, like to yeah. me, that was like uh, a neat part of his style. Um, so Jack Kirby was one of the first people I could identify. And then I was really into Joe Staten at the time because he was doing E-Man at Charlton. And that just really like, really was like right in my wheelhouse in terms of like, it had a pretty girl in it. It was it was like loose, not loose, but it was very vibrant and bouncy cartooning. And all that stuff really appealed to me. And then on the other pole of that was Bernie Wrightson, who I was just starting to see through um, 
uh, DC was doing those dollar sized reprints of the original Swamp Thing saga. And I had gotten a hold of those through my uncles. And like just seeing this, like how like kind of scary and dark and chilling comics could be. So I had these two, two like twin poles of Planet Phil, and they were Joe Staten and Bernie Wrightson. And then all the rest was filled in by guys I could identify and enjoy and like, like Neil Adams and John Byrne. And, and then when I was in my early teens, Frank Miller came along and sort of just like took over my life. I, I can see that, especially because like the heavy shadows and stuff and the heavy inks that you do, especially with like the, a book like The Wretch, like The Black and White, um, which is one of my favorite books, by the way. But uh, I do want to know when, I mean, often creators I talk to, like, I've heard it said, like, once you start making comics, even if it's for, for yourself, you can call yourself a comics creator. So obviously, I'm sure you started creating comic books long before we actually ever saw it in, yeah. in print, right? What, what was the first book that you launched with? Oh, boy. Well, I got serious about it in high school. And I went to a very, very small high school. My graduating class was 36 people. And, oh, wow. um, but I still found like in the, like the whole high school is like a hundred people. <laughs> so, but I still found like two or three other guys that were really into comics. And I don't know if they were as like gung ho as I was, but I sort of made them as gung ho as I was. And we like formed our own little publishing company and we made it a point to like, put out a wide variety of books and we photocopied them gave them to our friends and we had all sort of like and it was it's kind of comical looking back on it now how like seriously I took it I was like we had deadlines and we had to have certain issues out by certain times um but uh the very first book that people noticed that I did was a thing called Captain Squatty Body and that was a I, we had we had a algebra teacher who everyone was sort of afraid of, uh, but he was really kind of a short, stocky little guy. So we made up a, a superhero based on him called Captain Squatty Body, and that's how we sort of got back at him for being a kind of a, a mean teacher. Well, not mean; he was just stern. And later on, I found out that he actually loved it. He he thought it was great. Um, <laughs> but it was sort of set in the school, and the whole idea was like. Everybody at the school was secretly a superhero or a supervillain, and um, and Captain Squatty Body was all about that. And then we took off from there, and we had other uh, we had like a horror anthology that we did in high school. We had a superhero book. We did a parody of our own superhero book, <laughs> but just because we thought parodies were what you had to do. Um, and we even did like kind of a semi porn comic too, because like. We had all different kinds of friends who all wanted different kinds of books, and we were there to we were there to please all of them. I, when you get published for the first time, besides like the stuff that you were doing, what yeah, was the I, first uh, or was published? I well, I'd been like submitting back in the day. There was a book called Amazing Heroes, which was, yes, yeah, like a spinoff of Fanagra of Fanagraphics Comics Journal that was more geared toward the superhero market mm -hmm. um, intentionally. Um, and it was still like hard news and opinion and reviews, but it was limited to superhero stuff. And um, they would run illustrations that people had submitted in the back. So like all through high school, I was sending them, <laughs> I was sending them submissions and never seeing them print, not knowing that they had like years worth of backlog. And then when I got into college, I was, you know, I was still buying Amazing Heroes and I wound up seeing a lot of those printed there. And I got checks for him, which was like, they'd send you like a check for four ninety five, dollars which was like, to me, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm a pro now because I got this check for four ninety five. dollars But the, the very first thing I did was during the black and white explosion that came right after Turtles. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, as soon as Turtles came out, like, it, it was a credible business plan to have, if you like had a, a line of credit of $5,000, you could print a comic book. And back then, comics were selling like anything sold. Like shop owners would order everything just in case it was the next Turtles. And they'd right. order, you know, more than pre-order. Pre-orders didn't really exist. They would order like what they knew they could sell and a little bit more just in case it was hot. So for a $5,000 investment, you, you were sort of guaranteed to sell $15,000 worth of comics. So like overnight, there were like tons of new publishers. 
And one of them was a publisher called Silver Wolf Comics. I know Silver Wolf. That's where like uh, Tim Vigil got his start. And yeah. Land. Grips. And, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And Gary and Merrill, a lot of guys like that. And me. And I got my start there too. And I wound up doing, I think only two books that came out, but I think I, I think I drew like eight books for them. What were those books? I, I, I mean, I'm. <laughs> yeah, I hope you'll never find them. What? <laughs> Because I was like 19 when I drew these books, so they're terrible. Um, but I drew a book called Port, apostrophe P-O-R-T. It was about a character that could teleport. Um, and he was also like kind of a gray area. He was he was a thief, but he was kind of a good guy. He was kind of like Ant-Man, you know. He was mm -hmm. a good guy, but also a thief, and he could teleport. Um, and then uh, when Tim Vigil like got too big for grips... I, I replaced Tim on Grips. Oh, those shit. never came out. <laughs> oh, they never came out. All right. Those never came out. Um, but yeah, those were my big two assignments for them. That's awesome, man. And so where do you go from there? Well, I mean, you kind of get your break that way, right? Like you kind of get your foot yeah. in the door um, during that explosion, which is, I mean, there's there's a lot of cool stuff. I mean, I've gone back and, and like, I look for, for old black and white boom comics because I just think it's the energy created around that was really cool. Like a lot of them are like super amateurish, but they're very vibrant. It's a lot like the golden age. Like yeah. the stuff is kind of primitive, but it's like undeniably enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. So like there's a lot of a lot of stuff that's just a mess, but it's kind of a glorious mess. You know, like you can see that like the creativity coming from these people. So from there, I sort of kicked around uh, places like uh, Eternity. Um, and I felt like I found a home with Caliber. And at Caliber, I did a book called Fringe with my buddy, Paul Tobin. And uh, also did a lot of short stories for Negative Burn at that time. Um, and was starting to get uh, backups, like in books like Nexus and Badger. Um, and to me, that felt like making it, you know, like getting doing like... Um, Due to the hammer stories and in the back of Nexus felt like because I I like worship Steve Rude so like that no. felt like, that felt like making it to me and I and Peter David wrote him and like Peter David I'm working with Peter David so it was it was really like a thrilling time and when so can you take me from that point and then you create the wretch because I, I kind of want to pick your brain a little bit about the book you know the idea behind yeah. it and um, and all that right. So there's a, a big gap. There's a kind of a lar large gap in there where I kind of climbed the ladder uh, at DC. Like I wound up doing a flash annual very early for Brian Augustine, mm -hmm. who said that he passed away. And um, and from that, I became the regular artist on Swamp Thing, which to me was like coming like full circle from fandom to pro. Cause like I loved, I loved Swamp Thing when I was a kid. So getting to do it to me was like, incredible to me even though I was never satisfied with the work I did on that book um I still didn't care because it was sort of like, swamp thing yeah yeah it was fun it's sort of like I know I'm I know my wife is out of my league but I don't care I'm still into her you know yeah. <laughs> swamp thing was the same thing and um uh so I spent a lot of time not, not necessarily toiling but like early in my career doing a lot of assignments that were like um, I was just enthusiastic to be, to be doing comics at all. So I would take whatever came my way. So I do like a Namor annual or the Flash annual like about, or I do like foot soldiers at, at, um, at Dark Horse, you know, just whatever came around. And uh, after Swamp Thing, there was like a period when I really was like kind of chafing to do my own thing. Cause like, like we spoke about earlier, I was writing my own material in high school and in college and I always in you know in for short stories in negative burn so I always felt like I should be writing my own material a little bit and and the wretch was sort of my way to um write what was exactly in my wheelhouse which was stuff that was like lyrical and creepy uh but still whimsical and all but most importantly a vehicle for storytelling so I could do like really what I felt like was innovative storytelling at that time. And so every wretch story to me was like an excuse to play and to show off what I could do as a storyteller. 
And if I could inject like some humanity into the absurdity of the stories, that was like a bonus for me. So it's probably still to this day. I mean, I, I, I say I just did one. I did it like four years ago. <laughs> you know, I did, I just did a rest story four years ago and it's still, I still had that feeling for it, that it was like a place for me to be myself. And is that, is that a character that you see yourself like coming back to anytime soon? I'd like to, it's, it never sold really well. I mean, it, it was nominated for an Iser, but it never sold well. I don't, I always have ideas for wretch stories, you know, and I could see myself doing them. Um, but, you know, time is finite. <laughs> so yeah. like, I don't know. I can't say I will or won't ever get back to them. I would love to. Like if I, if I were independently wealthy, that's probably all I'd do. I mean, just a suggestion. I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. I love comic book shops, but you know, crowdfunding is, is uh, oh, definitely, yeah. I think, a very viable option for for stuff like that. I think a lot of you know, especially you know, your fan base, people, fans of the of the book, come out and uh, able to support it, so that you kind of get the funding beforehand. You know, so right, right. Yeah, something I want to explore. I mean, of course, I know enough about. I I've, I've backed enough Kickstarters and other fundraising crowdfunding books to know that and i've known enough people to, that have done them to know that doing them is hard work you know it's yeah. not just, oh i you know look how much money i raised uh a lot of that's gone you know a lot of that goes into printing and mailing and right. um, and people you have to hire to help you with them to be honest anything that takes away from creative time to me is a net is a, it's a deficit so right. i'm I'm always looking for the most painless way to create. And someday that might be crowdfunding. Um, but right now I keep finding my my dance card full of new projects that are as exciting and fun to me as doing the wretch would be. And I get paid for. Always a plus. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I want to like now touch on, you know, the way I discovered you, your art, your work for the first time was the the clerk's story you did with kevin smith which because yeah. i'm a huge kevin smith fan and that in turn i would imagine is what led into you guys pairing up on green arrow right yeah i by far probably one of my favorite runs of comic books i've talked about it so many times on this channel i've reviewed it a couple i think two or three times actually um i would love to kind of hear your take on like how that job came about like obviously i would imagine kevin was like I don't know if you like got to handpick you or how that worked out. Um, but what, how do you look back on, on that time uh, working with Kevin on that story? It was really exciting and fun and it definitely changed my life. Um, it took me from being, I was always kind of like, at, especially at time in my career, I was a tweener. Like I was like, I, I was too mainstream to be like a critical darling, but I was too weird to be a mainstream superhero artist. So it was like me and Dean Haspiel were like, <laughs> like the two guys, like the two guys that were like too weird to fit, couldn't quite fit either place, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, Kevin sort of dragging me into the mainstream with Green Arrow, sort of like got me in the door there. But to go back to how it began, I think, uh, I think it's well, it's almost entirely to do with Bob Shrek, who was at Oni at the time. And he was sort of Kevin's concierge editor at Oni. He was his personal guy. And he put books together for him. And Shrek, I'd been submitting to Shrek since he was at Kimiko. Um, and he'd always kind of been on the lookout for something for me to do for him. And it never quite worked out. And then I was in his Rolodex when he was at Oni. And they were looking for somebody to actually do a Mall Rats book, not a clerk's book. We were going to do a Mall Rats 2. Oh, cool. as a as a comic um and i worked up all the i worked up all the character model sheets and everything and kevin really liked how i would how i sort of got like um likenesses that weren't like really like slavish likenesses they were like captured the essence of the character without like being looking photo raft you know mm -hmm. and so he uh when that mall rights thing sort of fell through they had this law scene of clerks and Kevin's like, why don't we have Phil draw the law scene? And um, I did that, and it was a fun experience. And then in the interim, Shrek moved over to DC, and 
part of him moving to DC was that he could bring Kevin with him, who was a you know big time movie director. And Kevin was just coming off of Daredevil and Marvel with, with Joe and Jimmy. And I think it was his idea that Joe and Jimmy would come with him and do Green Arrow. In fact, I know it was, okay? <laughs> but Joe got this other job <laughs> in between like running Marvel. <laughs> so like he couldn't go draw DC's like flagship book. So I think I think Kevin just moved down on his Rolodex of people he was comfortable working with. And I was next after Joe Casada. So and and Shrek liked me and Shrek was the editor of the book. And Shrek also knew that um I had a good storytelling sense enough that I could take um because Kevin wrote a lot. Like on every page, like I don't know, I don't know if yeah. you read Quiver again recently. I did. Money's worth with Quiver. Like it takes a long time to read an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Bob knew that I could um, sort of parse that kind of dialogue-heavy storytelling and turn it into something dynamic on the page. Um, and I also knew like technical stuff by like when I knew there was a lot of word balloons on the page, how to block characters on the in a panel so. Their balloons would fit. Also, it was it was a great gig for me because I got to finally work with Andy Parks at, on a DC book because we we'd been trying to collaborate with each other for you know probably eight years at that point, and we had with smaller publishers, um, but we couldn't quite crack Marvel or DC together. We could crack it separately, <laughs> you know, like I was mm -hmm. doing Swamp Thing, and it was getting inked by Kim DeMolder. And meanwhile, Andy's over inking like Jim Balin on Catwoman. And, but we wanted to be together. <laughs> so Green Arrow was that time. Shrek saw that we belonged together and he put us together on the book. And so as unlikely as it was, it was, it, it was catapulting us from guys who could like barely get work at DC to guys doing DC's number one book, um, which was really trippy. Um, and also... Shrek knew that Kevin took a long time to write scripts. So we worked on that book for a long time before it was announced, like maybe a full year. So we had a lot in the can. Um, I, people don't remember this, but like um, that book didn't get late until like issue 11, which is pretty pretty rare for a Kevin book. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I don't remember it being late, but yeah. I mean, that was and also even then, was, a while ago. even then it was barely late, you know, yeah. and uh, uh, but for Shrek, that was like a massive accomplishment to get a book out from Kevin that wasn't late. Um, and it was it was a really fun experience and it sold like crazy and I still get paid for it today. Um, it still sells. It's kind of an evergreen book at DC. And um, even though the continuity's changed a million times and the status quo has changed repeatedly, it's one of those books that people still keep coming back to. So, and I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it's probably... I mean, it's definitely in my top five all time runs. I just, I, I've read it so many times. I mean, I have the singles, I have the trade, I have the absolute edition, it's so good. And then not to mention that you stick on for Archer's Quest with uh, Brad Meltzer, which is another, uh, I think, uh, yeah, it should it be in a room. I remember Shrek saying, well, Kevin's gone. And uh, I don't, I don't know if I've told this story publicly, but Kevin, Andy and I were supposed to go off of Green Arrow onto a new book, Brave and the Bold. And it was going to be Kevin's Batman, basically. It was like Batman team up book. And the first like six or seven issues were going to be Batman Green Arrow. And then it was going to move to Batman, whoever Phil wants to draw, you know, like, and, it, and that's what we were going to do. And then Kevin's life just got turned upside, you know, because like when you're a filmmaker, like comics are kind of a hobby yeah because <laughs> you, know, yeah. like, you know there's just so much more money on the film side of things so like his like film stuff sort of quashed that book which was kind of heartbreaking for us but shrek is god bless shrek he was like well listen guys don't worry about that look who i got coming on green arrow next and he had brad Meltzer, and after brad was jed winnick you know and so like it it he kept us happy on that book and we stayed on for like four plus years and it was only like i think we just were kind of feeling burnt out on the character we didn't felt burned out with our relationships with 
the creators in any way. We just felt like it was it was time to move on and, and there might be some more fun stuff for us to do at DC, especially like we felt like we belonged in the bat office a little bit. And mm -hmm. uh, so we kind of, we went off of Batman and on to Nightwing for, for a time. Yeah, that's right. I, I, you know, I almost forgot about the whole yeah. Nightwing run. Dude. Yeah. I mean, not in Dick Grayson, I mean, I kind of like him better than Bruce Wayne. If I'm being completely honest, yeah. he's the character is to me more, a little bit more interesting. More um, relatable. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was another phenomenal uh, run. But I think in that time too, you, not only are you drawing those books, but you're writing other stuff. Fire Breather, I believe, comes out around that time, right? And Well, the first thing, the first big writing thing I had come out at that time was The Coffin, um, okay. which was the, like, I, t I tell this part of my career all the time too, but like the year before The Coffin and Green Arrow, those sort of happened at the same time, like 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. like the year before that was like my worst year in comics like the year before that I was like looking at day jobs um because I had done a lot of work for kitchen sink that year and they went out of business owing me a lot of money and I I kind of left I didn't leave comics as much as there were some opportunities to storyboard and animation and I wound up taking a lot of st uh, storyboard jobs during that time and they were cool shows. Like I would, I was animating, I was storyboarding on the Batman and the Superman shows, Men in Black, Big Guy and Rusty, like cool shows. Mm -hmm. There still wasn't comics. And so like right before Green Arrow and the, and the Coffin hit, it was kind of my low point. Um, but it all turned around when those two things happened at sort of the same time. And The Coffin's a book I did with Mike Huddleston, this science fiction horror book. Um, and it really blew up at that time. And it's still like sort of a, people still talk to me about it today and there's still really a lot of hardcore fans dedicated to that book. And then right after that also, I, I was doing Fire Breather with Andy Coon, you know. And then you also, during that time, I mean, I, I know that that one's, you, I think there's what, two mini series for that, a one shot, I mean, yeah. animated series too. Yeah, it was an animated movie, just one. Or a movie, movie. animated yeah. movie. A feature, yeah. Um, and then you also do an extended run on The Darkness as well. Yeah. How did that How did that project come about, of all characters? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, the characters, it makes sense for your kind of aesthetic, but how did, i just curious how that project came about that's, as well. That's largely, I think, down to two people, Philip Sablick and Rob Levin, who are sort of like boosters of my of my especially my writing at the time they were more interested in my writing than my than my drawing mm -hmm. uh, which is cool because it's 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 neat to see another generation of editors come along to see me as more than just an artist and um rob really pushed for me to get on that book and i found like once i found got into it and got into his voice i found it super rewarding and super fun to write like writing you know, writing an anti-hero like that is uh, is kind of liberating. You know, yeah. you can sort of like exercise all your demons on a character like that. Um, and uh, it was it was a breeze. Like writing a character like that was just really rewarding. And and, and that's and that's kind of something I want to ask too. Like when you're approaching each project, obviously you're going to approach it differently if you're writing it or if you're illustrating it. And sometimes you're doing both. Um, how do you attack a project based on what you're doing? Like what your, your position on that book is? Well, I try to bring like, I try to bring what's, what's good about me, what I can provide to anything I'm asked to pitch. And so like, I don't try to mold myself too much to the character. And I've missed out on several projects this way. Like I've been asked to, pitched some really recognizable characters and what I gave them back was this is my take on this character and it has not been right for the, you know, the, the publishers like no 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 you know we don't want mm -hmm. that and I have to reconcile myself to the fact that if I'm going to do work that I feel good about and that I uh, I'm proud to produce I got to do it like my way so I can't really force myself to write it 
towards somebody else's expectations. And that sometimes means missing out on a project, you know, and you have to resign yourself to that fact. And in fact, I just missed out on a huge one because I, I wrote a pitch that the publisher was like, this is wild and this is cool. This is too wild. <laughs> you know, this is not going to work for our character. And I was like, hey, that's cool. Come back to me when you think it can, you know. Dang. Well, uh, what I mean, you don't have to tell me the project because you probably can't, but I what can't. publisher was it? I can't tell you that. Can't tell me that? All right, whatever. Recently, of the stuff that I know, know that you've been doing, like, I really loved the start of Philip Kennedy Johnson's Superman run that, that you did the two-parter for. That was really awesome. You're doing some Justice League stuff with Bendis. Um, what other stuff do you have in the work that we can kind of be on the lookout for? Well, I just did a Batman short story with Rom V for their... Uh, Halloween special. I mean, Halloween, Valentine special. Um, I'm always doing stuff for their Halloween specials, but I just did for DC's Valentine special. We did a cool Batman Riddler story that uh, I'm really proud of. Um, I'm always writing stuff that's in the pipeline, maybe not out yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to be coy. I don't want to be a jerk, but I'm working on like a really huge project right now and I can't like talk about who my co creators are. And I can't even talk about what it's about, but it, it's like, it's probably the biggest thing I've done for DC since Green Arrow. But it's, it's really exciting and it's really sort of, um, I think once people hear the concept, they'll be, uh, they'll be amazed that this book hasn't been done before today. Very cool. And is it new collaborators? I mean, I know you can't say who, but yeah, it... it's all, it's all new people for me. Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, it's very fun. And it's, I, my, I've been on a very long streak of, of creators that I'm like, uh, not good enough to work with, but I'm going to, I'll take it, <laughs> you know? I'm very excited about that. I mean, like I said, anytime I get a new project for me, whether it's written or drawn by you, I'm always going to be, a, be there to pick it up. Um, and in terms of like creator own stuff, so do you have any ideas that you kind of want or got percolating that you that you'd like to get to? Oh, always. I have a graphic novel that I uh, well, graphic novella is probably the right word that I'm working on for Aftershock, kind of a horror thing, and not kind of. It's a horror thing. <laughs> um, I'm working on um, uh, a science fiction horror thing that's going to come out for Moni someday. We've been working on it forever, uh, but the artist is kind of. He has a real job, so it kind of slows him down. So we kind of work on it when he can. Um, but I'm, like I said, I've always got like a million different things going. You sort of have to start 10 projects to have one actually come out. Mm -hmm. And that sort of was the mode I'm in. I always have uh, creator on stuff cooking. I've just been so busy like this last like year and a half drawing um, that I haven't, my writing output hasn't been quite up to my normal standards. Okay. You said it kind of, I think at the beginning of our chat, you know, that you are still like firmly entrenched in being a comic book fan as well. And like yeah. what you're reading, I was wondering if you could share, you know, maybe some of the, the books or creators that you're currently digging that um, you kind of want to, you know, shout out. Oh, well, I follow creators more than projects. Okay. So like, I, you know, I'll follow Daniel Warren Johnson to whatever he does, you know. Um, uh, uh, there's a creator named Matthew Allison that I'm... Kinkor, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I love James Heron, anything James Heron does. Uh, I'm really into the, like, the experimental stuff that Jesse Lonergan does. Uh, I love Caitlin Yarsky and her stuff. So, like, I'm always, like, following different creators to, like, like different books they do. Um, I'm lucky I got I got to collaborate with Jeff Lemire and he's somebody that I, you know, follow around and buy pretty much whatever he does too. So I'm always like just hunting around and and if if somebody is doing interesting stuff, I'm gonna check it out. Even if I don't feel even if it's not like a hundred percent effective, if it's taking risks, if it's trying new things, to me that's that's worth it and that's the fun part of it for me awesome man and um you know I, i'm kind of curious too like with, especially with so many artists doing digital what is are, are you still working traditionally or have you kind of done more of the digital aspect of it no i'm like a lot of people know i'm a, i'm also an original art collector 
So like the idea of not producing a tangible piece of art at the end of it to me is kind of strange. I, I, I have to have something I can hold in my hand. Mm -hmm. But also I like the fact that there's no undo button <laughs> like on a piece of paper. So like if you get yourself in trouble, you've got to draw your way out of it. And to me, I'm not like the greatest master of drawing in the comics business. Like, like on the scale of like uh, draftsmanship, I'm definitely in like the lower percentiles of, of working comic book artists. But I think what's interesting about my stuff is that struggle between what I want to accomplish and what I can accomplish and the solutions I have to come up with within my own drawing style. And I think that provides like what's interesting to look at in my work. Um, and I feel like, uh, although I feel like there's tons of ways I can express myself digitally and someday I'll get to that, um, I still really love the tactile sensation of drawing and I can't quite give that up yet. And I also love the fact that there's something on a piece of paper when I'm done that'll be here when I'm done. <laughs> you know, I love I love that man. I love that answer. Um, that kind of you know, like so I think it's a great spot to end. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. Um, if you do, I'm not sure if you do commissions or not, but I mean, I I know you. I mean, if you're drawing traditionally, maybe that is something you do. Um, yeah. For people that want to get a commission or want to find you online. I was wondering if you could share that information and I'm going to drop the links down below for yeah. everybody. Sure. Yeah. I'm just Phil Hester on Twitter. Um, and my DMs are open if you want to get a hold of me. And uh, I, I do take commissions, but I don't make promises as to when you'll get them. And because of that, I don't take your money. <laughs> so like uh, if you can make a request and I will eventually get to it and then we can talk about you paying, <laughs> but not until then. Okay, cool, man. Well, again, thank you so much for taking time to chat with me. It was a huge pleasure. And I definitely want to have you back on the show when you can talk about this project that you couldn't yeah, I'll share. I'll probably be able to talk about it over the summer. All right. Sounds good, man. Well, thank you again. And uh, everybody listening, watching, make sure you hit those links down below. Follow Phil on, uh, on all the social media. Hit him up for a commission. And uh, can't wait to do this with you again sometime, man. Thanks so much, Ryan.